today we're going to start into our new Advent series that we're doing through the uh, month of December called Wise Gifts. And we'll be taking this um, from the part of the Christmas story from Matthew chapter 2 will kind of be where we'll be at over the next three weeks. And uh, if you can kind of guess maybe where we're going with this, uh, I don't know, just wise gifts, and, and thus the Christmas gifts all over the stage and out in the lobby, it's just to kind of promote the theme that uh, we'll be talking about during this week's, the, the wise gifts that were brought by the Magi, by the wise men. As we, as we start with that, if you want to turn over there, you can to Matthew chapter 2. Get your Bibles out. Turn them over there. Come on. The ruffle of the pages is always a good sound, right? Yeah, or the, the swipe of your phone as you're moving up is also a good sound. Um, let me give you a little context to uh, us starting here today, okay? Uh, the context is that Jesus was born, as you know, in Bethlehem during the reign of King Herod, right? And uh, during that time when he was born, there was some magi, and magi, we also know them as wise men, traveled a long ways to come and worship the king. They saw a star in the sky, and they realized that there was something foretold about that in the scriptures, and they, they wanted to come and worship that king. And so what they did was they traveled a long ways with great gifts for this king. And, uh, you know, when we think about the wise men, there's something that uh, most of us realize or don't realize, we think about it, and that is, how many wise men were there? Silence across the room, right? Many, many of us say three, because we always think of the three gifts, but the reality is, thank you out of the balcony, nobody really knows how many wise, was there a pack of them? Was there a, a whole horde of them coming? We don't really know, do we? What we do know is that they were highly educated, that they were very wealthy, and they desperately wanted to, to worship the Savior of the world. And that's why they traveled so far. And so we're going to pick this up in uh, chapter 2, verse 10. And I want to read to you some scriptures. And we're going we're to jump out of here into some other scriptures in just a few minutes. But it says this, verse 10. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. And they entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasure chests, and they gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, when Teresa and I had our, our first child and our second child, you know, we had baby showers, right, which is normal. But uh, I don't remember anybody bringing me some gold. I would have liked to have seen a little of that. That might have been nice, right? Gone a long ways towards that college education, eh? Uh, nobody brought me some uh, frankincense, um, uh, and nobody brought me any myrrh. What they did bring me was some diapers and some wipes, some blankets, right? Some onesies. Uh, they, they, they brought me some pacifiers, and not me, my wife, because I wasn't there. They, they brought us those snot sucker things, right? Snot sucker things, right? You know what I'm talking about? You have a little... There's a new one out these days, I guess, that you can like literally... And I don't, I don't know how you'd want to do that, but it's like you can literally do it yourself. And I'm just like, you know, I'm a do-it-yourself kind of guy, but mm, I got to draw the line somewhere, right? But these wise men brought three gifts. And, and these gifts were not only valuable, but they were practical. And there was even some deeply spiritual meanings behind these gifts. And, and over the next three weeks, uh, we're going to talk about those. Bible scholars agree throughout history, that not only were these gifts useful for the family, but within those gifts, what we find and what we see within them is what we would call a foreshadowing of what Jesus would represent. Because there was a representation within those gifts of what was to come. In the gold, we find that it represented the kingship of Jesus. In the myrrh, we see that it represents the suffering, and, uh, the suffering servant and the Lamb of God within Jesus. But when we get into the frankincense, and that's where I want to land today, is I want to talk to you about frankincense, all right? So it's an incense, of course, thus it's in the name Frank, incense, all right? That's pretty logical. What I find with uh, the essential oil gurus that are out there today, they kind of consider frankincense to be the Swiss army knife of, of, of oils, of things like that. And I thought, well, okay. When I looked it up, it possesses things like an antiseptic, it can be used as an astringent, a diuretic, 
uh, di- diure- yeah, diuretic, a digestive, as a sedative. It can be used for in uterine. Uh, it has vulner- vul- vulnerary therapeutic properties. I don't even know what some of these things are. I just know that that's what it said. Okay, so just full honesty here. Uh, it's, it's just what's listed there. But what I do know is this. Frankincense is very expensive and a very practical gift. It helped treat sickness and wounds uh, within the family, and that's part of what it was used for. But also, it was very spiritual in what it was doing. There was a spiritual application because in the Old Testament, the priests, as you know, many priests burned um, incense and they burned things, right? They, 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 they did that as a, a way to create a fragrant offering uh, which went up to God, and it symbolized as it burned. It symbolized the smoke rising, symbolized the prayers ascending to heaven. So there was a lot of symbolism in that. And, and Bible scholars agree that frankincense symbolized the priestly nature of Jesus. They symbolized Jesus as our high priest. And that seems a little strange to us because we don't necessarily move in the realms of priests, Right? But in the Old Testament, we find that there was within the realms of, of, of priests, and they were active in that way. And unless you were raised maybe a Catholic, Jesus as our high priest might seem a little confusing to you. Uh, it might seem a little unusual. And so let me kind of break it down to you this way today and, and show each of us a little bit about that. So the priests in Scripture, okay, uh, they served one primary role, and they had two main functions within that primary role. And we're talking Old Testament priests. The, the priests within the Old Testament, the primary role was to be the representative of the people to God. That was their primary purpose. They, 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 they would go in and speak to God on the people's behalf. Now, the two functions that the priest carried out within that were these. Number one was that the priest made sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. Basically, they sacrificed animals so that they could receive forgiveness of sins for the people. The second function was that the priest prayer, prayer, per, 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 let me get that out there. The priests prayed prayers, how's that, on behalf of the people. They were the representative of the people to God. So he spoke on behalf of God, and there was one high priest. So let me talk for a minute about the two functions and where we see Jesus maybe as our high priest uh, in the sacrifices and in the prayers that the Old Testament high priest used to provide. If we start with the sacrifice, the one that's for our sins, which that's where the Old Testament was, since the first moment of Adam and Eve that they sinned, there was two opposing things that were colliding there, two forces that were coming together. There was the holiness of God, And there was the sinfulness of mankind. Would you agree with that? Yes. The holiness of God and the sinfulness of mankind. Sin isn't a popular concept. You know, some people are out there and they're like, well, who's to tell me that what I'm doing is sin? I feel good about it. What I feel good about, I should be able to do, right? What's what's true to me isn't necessarily true to you, someone else might say to us. Who, Who needs sin? Someone else might think within themselves. One person said this. They said, sin is an outdated term that's used to scare children into being good. You know, and it's so not. But that is the mentality that has happened within our society today. And here's the big challenge that we face, is that we have to understand the reality of sin because There's the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. And here it is. And if we don't understand the holiness of God, we will always have a casual approach to sin. Let me say that again, because that was a really good statement right there. If we don't, if we, if you, if you and I, if we don't understand the holiness of God, And what that really means, we will always have a casual approach to sin in our lives. If we can't grasp that holiness that he is, we won't be able to grasp the the cost, the tragedy, the the thing that comes upon us uh, when that sin enters into our lives and what it will do to us. We can't get a hold of that. What it does mean is that God is holy. 
God is holy. We say that, we know that, but do we truly understand what that means? Let's go back and take a look at the Greek word, okay? In the Greek, the word for holy is hagios. It means set apart. It means separate. It means perfect, flawless, pure in every way. Holy is to be set apart, is to not be affected by anything else. Holiness isn't one of God's attributes, and that's sometimes what we think. That's one of his attributes. It's not one of his attributes. It is the perfection of all of God's attributes. His power is holy. His justice is holy. His mercy, thank goodness for mercy, is holy. Holiness makes him worthy of praise in our lives. He is holy. He is perfect. We're not good. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? All of us have fallen short. It's true in all of our lives. Sin breaks the intimacy that we have with a holy God. The wages of sin is what? Death. That is why God hates sin, because it separates us from him. It's everything he's not. It's the opposite of holiness. It separates us from God. It hurts our lives. It destroys our lives. Therefore, God hates sin and what it does to us. You know, uh, we, we, we begin to feel that when we tell a lie, right? If we, if we lied to someone and we deceive someone we love, we feel guilty. Why? Because we know that's wrong. We feel that separation begin to happen. If we start experimenting with substances or, or alcohol or things in our lives that, that take what God wants us to be as holy, it separates us from him. It begins to rob us of intimacy that we might have with the Lord. His holiness of God and the sinfulness of man, they're always at war. The high priest in the Old Testament... I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going into this just to help us to understand a little bit of why God wants to be our high priest in that. It, once a year, he sacrificed as a temporary payment for our sins of the people on the Day of Atonement. He would sacrifice animals to cover the sins of the people for one year. The priest sacrificed an innocent animal, and, and he would take and he would uh, cut the throat of the animal, and he would put the, uh, the blood into a container and take it in, and he would sprinkle that within the, the tabernacle behind the veil that was there where the Holy of Holies was, and he would sprinkle that blood upon the mercy seat. This symbolized the death of an innocent one in place of a guilty one as payment for their sins. You're understanding the symbolism that's here and what God is doing here and why it's so important. And, 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 and we also look at it, you know, at times they would use a, gate, a goat. And a goat, uh, people would confess the sins to the priest. And the goat would symbolically, they'd take the goat, it would symbolically, symbolically transfer those sins onto the goat. And then they would drive the goat out into the wilderness off a cliff or something like that and allow it to die. Therefore, the first animal died as a sacrifice paying the price for our sins. Does that make sense? And so what we would see there is the, the sin would be removed for another year. Symbolically, what we had was what we know today as a scapegoat. That's where that term comes from. It's something that pays for somebody else what they did wrong in their lives. They become a scapegoat. And it was run out of the community, symbolizing that the sins had been removed from the community and that the people could go on for another year and live life. Now, to some of us, we may be hearing this, you know, and, and may not be the first, thing, uh, first time we've ever heard, maybe it is, and we're like, that's weird. We've never heard that before, you know, to cut the throat and to sacrifice a, an innocent animal, uh, you know, and put that blood into a container and take it in and sprinkle it on a piece of furniture. That, that, that's kind of extreme, a little bit gross, you know, we think about that, uh, to kill innocent animals. Who, who could come up with something like this? Can you imagine PETA would have a, just a field day? They would be beside themselves today if, if that were still going on for the forgiveness of sin, right? PETA would just be, oh my goodness, right? Here's what's important to understand. 
Because God is just, and he has to punish sin because he's just, not only is he just, though, but he's also merciful. So we have a God who's just, who's holy, but yet he also has mercy. And, and here's the exciting part of what God does in that. See, the sacrifice satisfies God's justice, and at the same time, it extends mercy. That's why the sacrifices of animals were happening at that time. It is the price that is paid, but someone else has to pay the price for the forgiveness of sins. Somebody else has to come and give that price to be paid. And God's holiness and justice is satisfied within that sacrifice. And he extends mercy to the people that he loves so much because of the sacrifice that was given. That was a temporary covering in the Old Testament, right? And we're not under the old covenant any longer, are we? That would be a great place to say no. We are not under the old covenant any longer. We are under the new covenant. We are under the new covenant. And let me tell you what it says. If you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 10 today, let me tell you what it says in Hebrews 10 verses 10, 11, and 12. Check this out. It says this, For God's will was that for us to be made holy... How did this happen? For us to be made holy is by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once time for all. Once for all time. We we celebrated that this morning by taking communion. What he's done for us, one time for everything, he became the ultimate sacrifice, the pure lamb, the one that was slain for us under a new covenant, not the old covenant any longer. Verse 11 goes on to say, under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away the sins. But here it is. Our who? High priest. Who is our high priest? His name is Jesus. Our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins. Good for all time. Not impartially. Moments, it's for all time. Praise God. That's a great place to put your hands together right there. It's not a temporary covering, but Jesus, as our high priest, offered his life, shedding his innocent blood as a covering for our sins, satisfying the justice of God and extending the mercy of God once and for all time. Let me illustrate to you, this to you just in another way, all right? Let me give you just a little bit of an illustration. Luke, can I borrow you for a minute? I didn't prep this with him, so he, he may be mad at me later, but right now he'll come because he's going to be on camera. <laughs> Let me illustrate this just in another way for you, all right? Because we have to, sometimes we have to see things visually to get it. You know what I mean? So come up up here in the light, and I'm going to just throw this over your shoulders. So this is, this is us, all right? And this is a very stinky jacket and a very dirty jacket, isn't it? It's, it's not in great shape, right? It's bad shape. I've had worse. I've, well, we've all been worse, right? But uh, this, is, this is how we come to God, is with a, a worn, tired, sad, in sh- uh, bad, sad shape uh, of, 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 of our lives. And, and what happens is, what Christ wants to do in our lives is he, as our high priest, as our propitiation, big word, as our one who stands in the gap for us under the new covenant, what he comes to do is to take what has been bad and old in our lives and bring a new robe of righteousness over us, a covering in our lives, if you will, that when God looks at us, he doesn't see the old worn out self that we were, the one with sin in our lives, the one that's hurting. When his righteousness was paid in our lives, what he sees is a brand new robe of righteousness covering us so that God can look down from heaven upon us because God can't look at sin. You know that. 
You know that he can't. That's why Jesus on the cross was like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why aren't you looking at me? Why can't I see you? And, and when, when Jesus is covering, as our high priest comes over us, when we receive him, God can look into us and see us. Because God is holy. He has provided this covering for our lives so that we have a way to be in the presence of God. No longer standing apart from God, we have the ability to be in God's presence. Can I get an amen out there somewhere? Thank you. God's our high priest who takes off his robe for us and puts it on to us so that we can be in the presence of Almighty God. He provides that forgiveness for us. Jesus, our high priest, paid the price for us to be able to have forgiveness of sin. Amen? Not a temporary covering, a permanent removal in our lives. And he's not just a distant Savior who feels sorry for us and feels bad for those poor people on earth. He is a high priest who understands our hurts. He understands our griefs. He understands our needs. And he cares about us. If we were to read a little further, or not further, but earlier in Hebrews chapter 4 today, if you want to turn over there, you can. 4 verse 14, it says this. So then, since we have a great high priest... Who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. Wow, aren't you thankful for that? That he understands your struggles, he understands your fears, he understands your pain, he understands your hurts, he understands everything you're going through the trials that you're facing, and he sympathizes with that. He understands that you're going through at this very moment. You know, if you're facing stress, Jesus faced stress in the Garden of Gethsemane. If, if you've got crazy people in your family, how many of y'all got crazy people in your family? Raise your hand. Hold them up there. Come on, come on. Wait a second. Leave them up there a minute. If you got a crazy person in your family, come on. This is a spiritual principle right here. Get your hand up there. All right, you got a crazy person in your family? Look around. Hold them up for a minute. Look around. If you see somebody with their hand not raised, maybe, just maybe. If you got crazy people in your family, when Jesus said, I am the Messiah, his family was like, the boys lost it. I can't believe he thinks he's the Messiah. He was, remember we talked about that, he was rejected by his family for a while. Think about how much Jesus understands you so that you can know how much he cares about you, how much he loves you. You think about Jesus and some of the stuff he went through in his life. He was conceived out of wedlock. All right, in that day, that was scandalous. That was amazingly crazy, should never have happened. He lived in poverty for a large part of his life. He was on the run from the authorities. Think about that. He was hiding, traveling to another country because he was on the lam. He was running from the government. He was criticized, ridiculed. He had been bullied. He was tempted by the devil over and over, attacking him when he was at his most vulnerable and weakest state. And he did not give in to sin. He had a close friend die and grieve the loss of many of his family members. He was accused of things he didn't do. His friends betrayed him. Some of them sold him out. Worst of all, in his, in his deepest, worst moment of all time, he felt deserted by God on the cross. He wasn't. But he felt that way in his worst moment. Because when Jesus became sin for us, our scapegoat, right? When he became our scapegoat for us, our sin covering, God looked away because God is too holy to look upon sin. And that's why he cried out, my God, my God, where are you? Where have you gone? I need you. 
You've ever felt like you couldn't reach the presence of Jesus? He understands, and he's right there. He understands how that feels. What you feel, he felt. Where you hurt, he hurts. He's not sitting in heaven and thinking to himself, wow, it really sucks to be you. Mm. Our high priest understands the pain that we face, each and every one of us. He has experienced all the pain in the human body and all the rejection of friends and all the agony and the hurting and feeling alone and abandoned in his life over and over. He understands. If you can imagine the details of God when he was putting all this together, knowing what was going to go on, because it says, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word, excuse me, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, speaking of Jesus himself. And then it says in John 4, one, excuse me, 114, he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among them. He is the God in the flesh for us. God born as a child, and he loves you, and he did that for you. And God in his divine providence, in his wisdom, in all that he has for us, sent the magi, the wise men, to offer gifts prophetically declaring the nature of Jesus that was to come. The gold, he is our king the myrrh, he is the suffering servant, the Lamb of God, prophetically talking about that. And the frankincense, Jesus is our high priest. The prophecy that was there foreshadowing what was to come for each of us 2,000 years later to help us to be able to see what was coming. In our times of need, he offered his life for us. He is our high priest who would be sacrificed for the forgiveness of our sins and each month we take a moment and remember that moment. He came for that. This is why Scripture is so important when it tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, it says, The high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. He understands our weaknesses. And then he says, Let us come boldly to the throne of grace of God, that we will receive his mercy boldly receiving mercy think about what that means right there why why his justice has been satisfied he is able to extend mercy to us and we find grace to help us in our greatest needs we have that from God for each and every one of us. It doesn't matter where you are at. It doesn't matter where you are struggling. He, he came for you in that moment. He came for you in those needs. And he died that we each can have mercy in our lives. And when you come to him, you don't have to cower and approach him formally maybe with King James Version language, we can come boldly with confidence. We can come boldly with assurance because we are loved. We, we are loved. Jacob, will you come? You know, today, in this moment, we have the opportunity in our lives to come boldly to him. He is a gracious God who has extended justice and mercy all in the same moment for us. And we need to receive his mercy to find help when we need it the most. For this moment, would you just close your eyes right where you're at and reflect on what God has given mercy to you Reflect on what he has begun in, to do in your life, in that journey that you are walking out with him. I want you to take a moment to reflect. In a few moments, I'm actually going to be opening the altars up for us to approach God as a moment where you can come to these altars and have a moment with God and approach him 
Old Testament, the Jews never got a chance to approach God. Someone had to do it for them. Under the new covenant, we have been afforded the beauty of being able to come and approach God directly. No need for anyone other than Jesus to stand between us and God. And he's there for that. I'm going to have the worship team lead us in just a chorus. I'm going to come back in a moment and open the invitation up for that. But as we sing this and as you have a reflection moment, would you stand all across this? You've been sitting for a little while now. I would love for you just to stand. We're going to sing just a portion of this song today. And I'll be right back to wrap this up. So stay with us and let's just worship him together, will you?